This Advent, we've learned about hope, peace, and joy. But it doesn't take long for things to go back to the way they were. Sometimes we need a reminder. What are you guys doing? Don't you know your one job is to love? Once we experience God's love, we start seeing it everywhere, among kids. Among adults. In our church. and in our community. I think they got it. Little things done with great love will change the world. I'd like to share just for a few moments to the adults and teenagers in the room, and I'd like to just talk about the little town of Bethlehem that that story took place in. We sing the song, Little Town of Bethlehem, but sometimes we really don't think about that town. So I'd like to show you three pictures of Bethlehem. Now, these aren't real pictures, at least the first two aren't. They're not real pictures, but they're mock-ups or whatever. Here's the first picture. This is Bethlehem, kind of a mock-up in the time of Ruth and Boaz. Whether it looked this way or not, I don't know. But 1,200 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a town called Bethlehem. There was a little town called Bethlehem. And there's some people in Jesus' family tree that live there. This is the great, 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 anyway, you get it, uh, grandparents of Jesus. Uh, Ruth and Boaz, if you were here in the church in October, we shared and talked about the story of Ruth and Boaz. They lived where? Bethlehem. It's this beautiful story. In that world at that day, there was violence everywhere. But in this little town called Bethlehem, there was love. In this beautiful story, the story of Ruth is this Ruth being an outsider, a Moabite, nobody likes Moabites, right? They're those people. Uh, this Jewish man named Boaz uh, married this outsider. And it's a beautiful story of love. And this is all in the family tree of Jesus. So in the midst of violence everywhere, in this little town of Bethlehem, there's a story of love. Love and acceptance and, and looking past differences and truly being a family together. And they had a little child born in Bethlehem named Obed, if you remember that story. A few generations later, there's a guy named David. Now, here's the interesting thing. They passed down land and houses from generation to generation. So, let's think about this. It's quite possible that Ruth and Boaz, the house that bore Obed, is the same house that David was born. <coughs> now, now I, we don't know for certain, but it's interesting to think of this was a real town, a real town that was trying to be different than the rest of the world. Violence everywhere, but this town, this town called Bethlehem, was trying to be different than everywhere else. Now, everywhere else was violence and war, but at that town, there was love and acceptance. Fast forward a thousand years or so. We have the story of Joseph and Mary going where? To Bethlehem. That same little town that we sing about, they came to that town. Why? Because there was a census. So Joseph had to go back home. He'd probably never been there, but he had to go back to his family. He had to go back to his ancestors. So here's the thing. Generations, generations, houses, land, shared, descendants, 
here comes Joseph knocking on the door with his pregnant wife of a flaming member, a descendant of David, a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. And in the, the scriptures, we were taught that it was an inn, but they didn't have inns the way that we had hotels back then. The word is translated guest room, and you heard that in the NIV version that Aubrey read. And so they knocked on the door of their family member, and there was no room. There was no guest room. The way the house is there, they had houses and rooms, but they always had a guest room because hospitality was so important in that culture. But with all the family members and all the descendants coming back to, um, for the census, that room was already full of people. So the family members said, why don't you stay downstairs with the animals? Downstairs with the animals kind of would have been like a, I don't know, kind of a basement. They would dig underneath the house, a basement area for the animals, and then they built a house on top of that. And in, in those days, um, uh, the animals at night would come inside uh, for safety, for obvious reasons, with wolves and everything. But also the animals would help bring warmth at night. And so where was Jesus born? Jesus was born in the lower level of the house. Was Mary and Joseph alone? Probably not. Probably surrounded by family welcoming the birth of the baby. Not a castle. Not a palace. A little lowly poor family. Descendants of some people who loved living there in that little town. No one knew it. But there was announcements, excitement. There was something different. In comes those shepherds, outcasts for sure, and they were welcome to worship this Christ child. This Jesus, God become flesh, the God of love become flesh. For the first time, they were able to see what God was really like, what love really looked like in a person. He was the prototype of a human being. He was the new Adam. He was the example of what everyone was to live. And he grew up and he extended love and compassion, especially to the outcasts. He fed the hungry. He clothed the naked and he challenged and ruffled some feathers, didn't he? He still does that, by the way. The people who have sin in our lives, this disease that's destroying us, he is the healer to come to bring forgiveness and cleansing that which I need as your pastor. So this story isn't just a story of love being born because somebody named King Herod was really upset. And what did King Herod do? What the world always does, violence. It's called the slaughter or massacre of the innocents as King Herod decided to try to wipe out the threat of a new king. Violence again. So you have this story of love and violence. The church took this message of love, and in the book of Acts, it said they turned the world upside down with that love. And the church grew and grew and grew, and it spread from house to house to house, and people were loving, and Jews and Gentiles, people who hated each other, were worshiping together. The rich and the poor, people who never associated, were together sharing a meal of love. And people were experiencing healing from that sin. They were experiencing freedom from the power of sin. Because on the cross, Jesus didn't just die to forgive us of sins. He died to break the power of sin over our lives so that we can love. So that we can love. Fast forward to the third picture. Bethlehem today. This is a picture outside the church in Bethlehem of a nativity uh, in the rubble. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to watch online a worship service from Bethlehem. And they were singing and worshiping. I didn't understand everything, but the sermon was in English. And the sermon hit me right here. Because over there, over there, far, far away, is that same town. Same town. That love was born. And they're experiencing violence. There's an icon that was uh, painted this week. I really enjoy this icon. It's called Christ in the Rubble. If we could put that on the screen. 
But what if Christ was born in Bethlehem today? Now, what can we do so far away? Here's the story of Christmas. Christ was born and gave us this beautiful example of love. And that should be the model for our lives and for every church and every Christian and every human being. We were all created in the image of the God of love to do what? To love. That's what we are created for. And love and violence are at the opposite uh, of a pole, right? They're opposites. Violence and war and greed and all those things are dehumanizing. They are destroying the image of God in others. Now, we can't solve what's going on in the Middle East, but we can receive the gift of love today and promise to love those around us. Because without receiving and sharing the gift of love, that love gets distorted over time. That city that was born of love forgot love eventually, just like we do. If we don't share the love that we receive at Christmas, it just becomes a good story, a sentiment, something that makes you feel good, traditions, nostalgia. But love is meant to transform our lives, our heart, when we receive that love that is a sacrificial, transformative love. And then when we share it, it becomes real. Changing the metaphor to a light, a candle. When we receive that light, it illuminates our lives. It allows us to see, like that blind ox, it allows us to see for the first time. But the power of love is when it's shared. Candle by candle, it gets brighter and brighter. The love that we receive is meant to be shared. It's a gift to be opened, experienced personally, but it's designed to be shared. And when we hold it and not share it, we ruin it. We have one job, one job, to love everyone always. That's the job of the church. Love God with our whole heart, Love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's where the self-care and the healing is important, right? Our blue Christmas is so important. We deal with our grief. Love God with our everything. Love our neighbor, which in a neighbor doesn't mean just the person who lives next door. It also means the people in Israel and the people in Palestine. And by the way, Bethlehem is where? It's in Palestine. We remember that we are called to love everyone always. That love your neighbor thing is to love everyone. Jesus even took it that much farther. He says, love your what? Your enemies. That's nuts. That's the call. That's what I was created for. That's what you were created for. That's what every person in this room and everyone worshiping online, that's what every church is created for. But not just churches and not just Christians. Humanity was created in the image of love. And so when we love people, all people, regardless of who they are, where they are, when we love the grumpy old ox because we're grumpy old ox, that's when change happens. Change happens. So you might be thinking, what in the world can we do with the mess in the world? Mother Teresa reminded us, little things done with great love will change the world. Do your little thing. Love those around you today. Love your family, your friends, your neighbors. Love, love, love. And love will transform the world. It did at one time. Turn the world upside down. And it will again. That's my hope. I share the gift of love with you today.